So the first question says define density. Density is de defined as mass per unit volume, or it's the ratio of the mass of an object to the volume of that object. Part B says a smooth pebble made from a uniform rock has the shape of an elongated sphere as shown in figure 1.1. The length of the pebble is L. The cross section A, uh, of the pebble in the plane perpendicular to L is circular with a maximum radius R. So this is the cross section that is perpendicular to this length L and it's circular and has a radius R. A student investigating the density of the rock makes measurements to determine the values of L, R, and the mass M of the pebble as follows. State the name of the measuring instrument suitable for making this measurement of L. So L is from this tip to the other tip. Now, because it's in the shape of a sphere, we cannot use a meter rule and neither can we use a measuring tape. हम इनमें से कुछ नहीं यूज कर सकते हमें कोई ऐसी चीज चाहिए जो यहां से लेके यहां तक का लेंथ बता दे एंड वी गॉट टू ऑप्शन यू कैन आई दर गो विद वर्नियर कैलिपर विच इज केपेबल ऑफ गिविंग यू अ मेजरमेंट लाइक दिस और यू कैन गो विद माइक्रोमीटर स्क्रू गेज विच कैन ऑल्सो गिव यू अ मेजरमेंट लाइक दिस बट द प्रॉब्लम हेयर इज दैट अ वर्नियर कैलिपर इज मोर सूटेबल गिविन द लेंथ एल ऑफ द रॉक as opposed to a micrometer screw gauge so the answer is one year caliper so apna and to answer your question one year caliper they may ask you simple questions on one year caliper but they won't ask you to take readings from a one year caliper or to adjust for zero errors stuff like that Part two says determine the percentage uncertainty in the measurement of R. What is the percentage uncertainty in R? That's a simple question. If you divide the uncertainty zero point zero 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 four divided by zero point zero four two, that gives you the fractional uncertainty. Multiply this by hundred, and you get the percentage uncertainty, which should be approximately. Equal to one percent. Let's double check. It's zero point nine five, so one percent. Yes. Part C says, the density rho of the rock from which the pebble in B is composed is given by. Rho is equals to m r to the power n upon k l, where n is an integer and k is a constant with no units. So k here has no units. That is equal to two point zero nine four. Use the SI base units to show that n is equal to minus two. You need to show that this n here is equals to minus two. Will writing zero point nine five be considered incorrect? No, zero point nine five percent is also correct. So you need to show that the base units of n are equal to minus two. How do you do that? You just substitute the SI base units for all the quantities involved, and we know that for a homogeneous equation, the units on the left hand side should be equal to the units on the right hand side. So density has a unit. Has the unit kilograms per meter cube. M has the unit M, which is mass, has the unit kilogram. R, which is distance or the radius of this rock, is measured in meters. We'll plug in meters here. To the power n divided by k is a constant with no units because we are substituting the units here. As opposed to the values, k will be substituted, will be replaced by nothing at all. Or you can write one if you want to. Multiplied by l, which is also measured in meters. Now, you just simplify. 
So kilogram here on the left hand side cancels out with the kilogram on the right hand side. This meter is in the denominator gets shifted to the other side and gets multiplied to the numerator. So m to the power minus three multiplied by m to the power one is equals to m to the power n. When bases are same, powers are added minus three plus one. So m to the power minus two is equals to m to the power n. Now, bases are same. You can compare the power. This tells us that n should be equal to minus two. Calculate the percentage uncertainty in row. What is the percentage uncertainty in row? Now, the percentage uncertainty in row, percentage uncertainty in row will be equal to the percentage uncertainty in M because rho is dependent on mass. So the percentage uncertainty in M plus two times the percentage uncertainty in R. Ye hamare paas two times kaan se aaya? N ki value minus two hai. Sahi? So negative sign hum ignore karte hai. Percentage errors are always added. So this becomes two because the value of N is minus two. Plus percentage error in K plus percentage error in So I have the equation that I need percentage error in mass plus two times Y two, because N here is equals to minus two, two times per percentage error in R plus percentage error in K plus percentage error in L. Now what I need to do is I need to plug in the values here. Do we have the percentage error in M? We don't. But we can calculate the percentage error in M 0 0.001 divided by 1.072 times 100. 0 0.001 divided by 1.072 times 100. Plus two times the percentage error in R. So two times, what is the percentage error in R? We've already calculated it. It's 0.95%. So we'll use that value 0 0.95 plus the percentage error in K, but K is a constant. It does not have an error. Since it does not have an error, there is no error. So there'll be no percentage error. So we'll just cancel it out. You don't need to write this at all though. Plus the percentage error in L. The percentage error in L will be 0 0.0001 upon 0 0.1242. 0 0.0001 upon 0 0.1242 times 100. And that gives you the percentage error in row. So if you calculate it, this will be. 2.07%, 2 2.07, 08, 2.08%. Now the question is, why, why are we using plus two instead of minus two? Won't there be a major difference if we input two instead of minus two? That's a legit question, but the thing is, okay, why did we not write uh, L as minus one? Why did we not write this as minus one? Even though it's in the it's in the denominator. So if I shift it to the numerator, the power becomes minus one. Say to ham isko aise bhi to likh sakte the na m upon k l to the power r squared. Now it's positive. You get my point. So irrespective of whether it's in the numerator or the denominator. You take the positive power. So minus two ho tabhi two lenge, minus three ho tabhi three lenge, plus three hoga to bhi three lenge. Is that clear? 
Okay. So 2.08% is the percentage uncertainty in row. Determine row with its absolute uncertainty. Give your values to the appropriate number of significant figures. Row with its absolute uncertainty. Now, calculating row should not be a problem. All we need to do is plug in the value for M, R, K, and L. So M, which is the mass, which is 1.072 times R, which is 0 .0 0.042, the entire thing raised to the power minus two upon K, which is 2.094 times length L, which is 0 0.1242. So I have the values here. I have the equation equation here. I have the value of K here. Just plug in the values and you'll get a value for row, which is equals to 2,336.67 kilograms per meter cube. So that's the absolute, uh, that's the uh, principal value. To calculate the absolute uncertainty, you need to find out 2.08% of this value because that is the error or that is the uncertainty. So 2.08% means divide by 100 of this value, which is 2,336.7 gives you 48.6 or 49, 49. So, so our principal value along with the uncertainty is 2,336.67 plus minus 49. Now that's not how you represent the uh, principal value along with its uncertainty you need to give it to an appropriate number of significant figure. How do we decide that? The error is always rounded off to one significant figure. So 49 to one significant figure becomes 50. You'd write this here. And the principal value is rounded off to the place value of the error. So the error here, this is how I taught you the error here is two decimal, two places to the left of the decimal. So our principal value will also be rounded off to two places to the left of the decimal. So 2,340 plus minus 50. So 2,340 plus minus 50. Let's move on to question two. Define momentum. Momentum is the product of, it's the product of mass and velocity. M times V. It's a one mark question, product of mass and velocity. I've said this once, I'll, I'll say this again, always write down the the definition in words as opposed to using the formula. It's always better to do it that way. So product of mass and velocity. Part B says two balls X and Y of equal diameter, but different masses, 0 0.24 kilograms and 0 0.12 kilograms respectively, slide towards each other on a frictionless horizontal surface as shown in figure 2.1. So it's frictionless. There'll be no loss of kinetic energy. Both balls have initial speed of 2.3 meters per second. Before they collide with each other, both balls have initial speed of 2.3 meters per second before they collide with each other. Figure 2.2 shows the variation with time T of the force Fy exerted on the ball Y by ball X. This is the, ball, this is the force exerted by Y onto X when they collide. Calculate the kinetic energy of the ball X before the collision. So the first part is pretty simple. You know the velocity with which X is moving. You know the mass of ball X. You need to calculate the kinetic energy. 
kinetic energy is equals to half mv squared half times mass of the ball which is 0.24 times the speed with which it's moving it's 2.3 squared gets us the kinetic energy which is 0.63 joules that's our answer part 2 says the area enclosed by the lines and the time axis in the in figure 2.2 represents the change in momentum of ball y during collision determine the magnitude of the change in momentum of ball y now even if they did not say that this is something that we've already discussed for a force time graph the area under the graph represents change in momentum for a momentum time graph the gradient of the graph represents the net force or the resultant force yes f is equal to delta p over delta t f force is rate of change of momentum so they want you to calculate the change in momentum and they've said that you need to find out this area over here so this is basically a triangle you need to find out the area of a triangle with the height of that triangle being the height of the triangle is this this is 240 each small box represents an increment of 20 so this is 240 that's the height and the base is 5 this entire thing is the base of the triangle so half into base which is 5 but there's a problem here the problem here is that you need to pay attention to the axis you can't use 5 over here because the answer is in newton second 5 here is in millisecond you need to convert 5 milliseconds into seconds this here is in newtons like it should be so half into 5 into 10 to the power minus 3 because milli times 240 that is the force yes and that gives us the change in momentum which is 0.6 newton second zero point six newton second that's the answer part three says calculate the magnitude of the velocity of ball y after collision so we have the change in momentum of ball y they are asking us for the velocity of ball y after collision so change in momentum is equal to initial momentum minus final momentum or final momentum minus initial momentum the only difference that you'll get would be of uh, a positive or a negative sign so our change in momentum is 0.6 our initial momentum of ball y is 0.12 times 2.3 0.12 times 2.3 and the final momentum will be 0.12 times v and just rearrange this to get the value for phi or you could have said change in momentum 0.6 is equals to 0.12 times 2.3 minus phi and you'll get a value for v the final velocity which is equal to 0.3 no not 0.3 It's equal to two point seven meters per second.
why is the final velocity same? The final velocity is not same. The mass is same. This is the initial velocity. This is the final velocity. It's 2.7 meters per second. So 2.7 meters per second. And because the question says the magnitude of velocity, even if you're getting a negative answer, minus 2.7 meters per second, which basically indicates that it's traveling in the opposite direction, even if you're getting something like that. So you'll just write 2.7 meters per second over here. Part C says on figure 2.3, sketch the variation with time T of the force Fx exerted on the ball X by ball Y during the collision in B. Now, this is a good question, even though it's a simple one. So what they've given you above is the force exerted on Y by X. Now they're asking you for the force exerted on X by Y. Now, you don't need to spend time trying to figure this out. And why don't you need to do that? Because Newton's third law says there's an equal and opposite reaction. So the force that X exerts on Y is equal to the force that Y exerts on X when they collide. So you'll get an exactly similar graph. I have the liberty to do this, but what you'll do is look at this graph and redraw it. Something like this, here we go. Exactly similar. Get the variation with time T of the force Fx on the ball. Yes. Aflan, that is correct. That is absolutely right. The graph would be exactly similar, but there'll be a difference here. The difference would be that the graph this time around would be negative. Equal, because Newton's third law says, yes. Newton's third law says every action has an equal but opposite reaction. So this one should be in the negative direction, but identical. It will be a reflection on the x-axis. So here we go. Thank you for pointing that out. So that's question number two. Moving on to question number three. A uniform metal bar initially unstretched has sides of length W, X, Y, as shown in figure 3.1. The bar is now stretched by a tensile force F applied to the shaded ends. The, the changes in the lengths X and Y are negligible. The bar now has sides of lengths X, Y, and Z as shown in figure 3.2. So we're applying a tensile force that basically causes length W to change. X and Y remain unchanged. W increases and becomes Z. This is the new length. Determine the expression in terms of sum or all of F, W, X, Y, and Z for the stress applied to the bar by the tensile force. What is the stress that is being applied to the bar? Now, I know that stress is force per unit cross-sectional area. And this here, the shaded region is the cross-sectional area. 
So force per unit cross-sectional area, which is Y multiplied by X, this rectangle here. Part two says the strain in the bar due to the tensile force. Vishal, why will it be F upon Y, X, X? It should be F upon Y, X. No? Y into X. Oh, Y X times X. Okay. The strain in the bar due to the tensile force. Now, strain is change in length upon the original length. What is the change in length? The length that change, the length change from W to Z. So the increment in length or the change in length is Z minus W. Yes. Divide that by the original length, which is W. So Z minus W upon W. As simple as that. The young modulus E of the metal from which the bar is made. Young modulus. Young modulus is stress over strain. There are two forces applying uh, stresses. So won't it be two times F upon X, Y? No, even there, there'll always be two forces that are being applied. You cannot have a stress when there's, a, when there's a force on one side. Afnan, pick up a pen, pick up a pencil, try to apply a force on only one side. You won't be able to, you'll be able to move it, but you won't be able to apply a stress onto it. So you'll always need forces on two sides, but stress is one of the forces divided by the cross-sectional area. You get it? Even if you tie it uh, to something, you fix this one end, you'll still be, there'll still be a force on the other end. So you always need two forces, but stress is, no, sir, I do not understand. You do not understand. Let's try to make you understand. So this is the rod and I apply a force on only one side. Will that cause a change in length in the rod? Afnan, how will that cause a change in uh, length? This will only cause the rod to move because there's a force in one direction that causes an acceleration. Pick up your pencil, hold it from one end and try to pull it from that end. Dusre end ko rehne do. Ek, ek end se pakdo aur bas usko khecho. Jo force lagegi uski wajah se kya hoga? Ki bas to move karega. Uske andar stress nahi aayega. Uske length change nahi hogi. Unless you hold it from the other side too. And then you apply a force. Haan, the opposing force basically prevents it from moving. Yeah and causes an increase in length. So you'll always need two forces, irrespective of whether you are the one applying both the forces or someone else does it. So force divided by area. Part three says, what is the young modulus E of the metal from which the bar is made? Young modulus is stress upon strain. All you need to do is plug in the equations that we formed above F upon X, Y, oh, sorry, F upon X, Y divided by, divided by Z minus W upon W. For some of you can do this directly. So what do you get F upon x, y times z minus w times w in the numerator or f, w upon x, y minus z minus w, x, y times z minus w. Here we go. It's maths. You take the reciprocal of this and multiply. And this is what you'll get. Part B says a copper wire is stretched by a tensile force that gradually increases from zero to 280 newtons. The variation with extension of the tensile force is shown in figure 3.3. 3. 
state the maximum extension of the wire for which it obeys Hooke's law. Now, what's Hooke's law? Hooke's law says that force is directly proportional to extension. So you need to point, uh, find the point up till which it's a straight line, up till which the force is directly proportional to extension or the change in length. So place a ruler on, on this line and try to see what is the maximum value up till which force is proportional to extension. So here we go. Let's go with a thinner line. Here. So for me, this is the maximum value. This here is equal to 2.2. So in, uh, Daniel Afnan, instead of uh, asking you the maximum value of force, they're asking you for the maximum extension of the wire for which it obeys Hooke's law. So this is 2.4, sorry, not 2.2, 2.4. So 2.4 millimeters. That is what I think. You, you may get a different value, slightly different value depending on, because there'll always be an error or an uncertainty associated, you, you may get 2.2 to you may get two, but somewhere between two and 2.4 is correct. So 2.4 millimeters is my value. On figure 3.3, use figure 3.3 to determine the strain energy in the wire when the tensile force is 120 Newton. Now for a force extension graph, the area under the graph represents energy. So you need to find out the area under the graph. So for a force of 120, this is a force of 120. This here is the force of 120 Newtons. And this here is the extension. So half into this value, I believe is 1.4. Yes. Half into base into height, but you can't just use 1.4. And the reason behind that is because they want the answer in joules. अब आंसर जूल्स में चाहिए जो कि ऐसा ही यूनिट है तो जो क्वांटिटीज इन्वॉल्व्ड हैं वो भी ऐसा ही यूनिट होने चाहिए ना मिलीमीटर इज नॉट द ऐसा ही यूनिट यू नीड टू फाइंड द आंसर यू नीड टू कन्वर्ट दिस इनटू मीटर्स सो व्हेन यू डू दैट दिस बिकम्स 1.4 इनटू 10 टू द पावर -3 टाइम्स हाइट व्हिच इज 120 एंड यू विल गेट योर आंसर 60 टाइम्स 1.4 इनटू 10 टू द पावर -3 व्हिच इज इक्वल्स टू 0.084 joules. So you've got the strain energy, 0.084 joules. Explain why the work done Achha, So there's a question here. The question says, how do we determine whether we can use, we should use half Fe or half Ke squared? Irrespective of the formula you use, you will get the same answer. They're both uh, uh, formula for energy and there's no limitation to what formula can be used. So when, what we just did was we found out the area under the graph. So even if we uh, thought that we are finding out the area under the graph, the formula that we used was half Fe. And this is convenient in this case. Why? Because if I go with half K E squared, I'll first have to find out or half K X squared. I'll first have to find out the spring constant, which is not given in the question. Sorry? So I can find out the spring constant, the gradient of this force extension graph up till the point where it's a straight line 
the gradient gives me the spring constant. So find the spring constant first, but if you find that incorrectly, there'll be an error in this too. So do that, you'll get the same answer. So as Ibrahim said, if they've given you the value for K, use half K squared. If they've given you the value for F, use half F E. But in any case, you can use both. So explain why the work done in stressing the wire to an extension of 12 millimeters is not equal to the energy recovered when the tensile force is uh, removed. So we are applying a force. We extend it. We get, uh, our force causes a total extension of 12 millimeters. But when we remove that force, you, we do not get the same amount of energy back. And the simple reason behind that is because our object has undergone plastic deformation or the wire suffers plastic deformation and there's energy lost in the form of heat or there's thermal energy lost. Yes. So you'll mention plastic deformation or you'd say it has exceeded the elastic limit and it's now in the plastic region. So it suffers permanent deformation. It has exceeded the elastic limit and suffers or undergoes is a better word permanent deformation. Thus energy is lost in the form of heat or energy lost as thermal energy. The plastic energy is the energy that causes permanent deformation, right? There's no, I won't say it's plastic energy. This elastic energy that's stored inside the object and some of that elastic or strain energy, some of this strain energy gets converted into, gets converted into, uh, into thermal energy. Ibrahim, you have your camera turned on. Okay. Question number four. By reference to the direction of transfer of energy, state what is meant by a longitudinal wave. So there are two types of waves as far as this differentiation is concerned. Obviously, different types of waves are there. So there's either a longitudinal wave or there's a transverse wave. An example of longitudinal wave is sound wave. And a longitudinal wave is one in which particles oscillate or move parallel to the direction of transfer of energy. If this was instead a transverse wave, we'd say particles os oscillate uh, perpendicular to the direction of transfer of energy. Part B says a vehicle travels at a constant speed around a wide circular track. It continuously sounds its horn, which emits a single note of frequency 1.2 kilohertz. An observer is a large distance away from the track as shown in the view from above in figure 4.1. So we've got our observer here. We've got our track over here and the vehicle moves in this direction. Now, figure 4.2 shows the variation with time t of the frequency f of the sound of the horn that is detected by the observer. So this is basically a question on Doppler effect where there's an apparent change in frequency when there's relative motion between the observer and the source. The time taken for the vehicle to travel once around the track is T. That is one time period. It starts from this point or any point and returns back to the same point. So this is what the graph looks like. A maximum value of 1.4. This here is a value, a lower minimum value of something. 
explain why the frequency of the sound detected by the observer is sometimes above and sometimes below 1.2 kilohertz. So the actual frequency is 1.2 kilohertz. And the question says, why is it that sometimes you hear a, hear a frequency greater than 1.2, which is 1.4, and sometimes you hear a frequency less than 1.2. And they're basically asking you for the explanation of Doppler effect or asking you what Doppler effect is without asking you what Doppler effect is. They want the same answer. So why does that happen? Because the vehicle or a sound source is moving relative to our observer. Our sound source is moving relative to our observer. That is why you observe a change in frequency. But the question is asking you, why is it that sometimes they're not asking you, why is there a different frequency or why is there, are there different frequencies observed? In that case, you would have written because uh, the vehicle or the sound source is moving relative to our observer. The question says, why is it that sometimes you hear frequency greater than 1.2 and sometimes you hear frequency less than 1.2? So when the vehicle or our sound source moves towards the observer, when the vehicle moves towards the observer, the frequency greater than 1.2 kilohertz is observed. And vice versa. Which means that when the vehicle is moving away from the observer, so a frequency, a frequency less than 1.2 kilohertz is observed. A lower frequency is observed. State the, uh, state the name of the phenomena in B1. We've already talked about it. It's known as the Doppler effect. On figure 4.1, mark with the letter X the position of the vehicle when it emitted the sound that is detected at time T. Let's see what is the frequency at time T. So at time T, the frequency is maximum. So the frequency is maximum, which means that the observer is traveling to, uh, the vehicle is traveling towards the observer at that instant. And that will happen at this point at point X for a vehicle at this position at this instant, it's traveling towards the observer. So you'll get maximum frequency at this point, which is at time T is equals to capital T. On figure 4.1 mark with the letter Y the position of the vehicle when it uh, when it emitted the sound that is detected at 90 by 4. Nine T by 4, 9 over 40. 9 over 4, 9 divided by 4, which is 2.25. So 2.25, this is 2.25. This here is 9 over 40 or 2.25 T. So this is 1.2 kilohertz. So 1.2 kilohertz is the actual frequency that was emitted out by our, uh, by our vehicle. And that will be observed at this point. This is our position Y. 
because at this instant our vehicle is traveling like this it's neither moving away nor moving towards neither moving away nor to moving towards the observer so we won't observe a change in frequency we'll actually observe the actual frequency so this is why now one question that's pretty common is why can't we label y over here obviously that would also result in 1.2 kilohertz being observed yaha ho ya yaha par ho aap observe kya karoge 1.2 kilohertz but why won't we label it over here because if we go back this point is immediately after a maximum is heard so the maximum is heard over here and 1.2 kilohertz would be observed at this point if they said what about this time period 2.75t then we would label it over here then we would label it over here is this clear that's question number 4 Oh, we're still not done there. Can I explain it again? Yes, I can. अच्छा जी. So the question says, Bushra, that on figure four point one, mark with the letter X the position of the vehicle when it emitted the sound that is detected at time capital T. At time capital T, a maximum sound is a maximum frequency is heard. Maximum frequency is when an object is or the sound source is moving towards the observer so when the sound source is moving towards the observer that is that position x at this point at the maximum point it's moving towards at that instant even though it's in circular motion but at this particular instant it's moving towards the next part says Mark with the letter Y the position of the vehicle when it emitted the sound that is detected at nine T by four or nine over forty, which is two point two five T. So two point two five T or nine over forty is over here, and the frequency heard is one point two, which is the actual frequency, which means that at that instant, the vehicle is neither moving towards nor moving away. So neither moving towards nor moving away would be over here. Or over here, it's traveling. Uh, sorry, it's traveling in this direction or in this direction. So it could be this point or this point. For this observer, it's not moving away or towards. Now, how do we decide whether it's to the right or to the left? This point is immediately after a maximum frequency is heard. Immediately after a maximum, which is at this point, and then there is a minimum after that. So the minimum frequency would be observed at this lower point when it's moving away. Do you get this? Speed of sound in the air is three hundred and twenty meters per second. Use Figure four point two to determine the speed of the vehicle in B. Speed of the vehicle in B. Now the formula for Doppler effect falls. Observe frequency is equal to v upon v plus minus v s f s. You either have a positive or a negative. depending on whether it's moving towards or away and you've got everything that you need except for this say vs so if i go with moving towards when it's moving towards the maximum frequency f not is 1.4 kilohertz 1.4 kilohertz so 1.4 Into ten to the power three is equals to v, which is the speed of sound, which is three hundred and twenty upon three hundred and twenty. I know that it, when it's moving towards, you'll use 
a negative sign minus vs fs the source frequency the actual frequency which is 1.2 into 10 to the power 3 this cancels out with this and then you can simplify to get a value for vs which is equals to 46 meters per second or what you can also do is use the formula but this time for when it's moving away so repeat the do the exact same thing again exact same thing there we go but we're now talking about it moving away so the frequency that will be observed will be minimum the minimum frequency is this value which is 1.05 this is 1.1 this is one, this is 1.05. So use 1.05. This, this time around, we'll use a positive sign because when it's moving away, use a positive sign. And that should also give you 46 meters per second. That's the speed with which the vehicle is moving. So that's the answer to C. I hope that's clear. Question 5a says, state Kirchhoff's first law. Kirchhoff's first law says that the total current entering a junction or a node is equal to the total current leaving the node or the junction. That's Kirchhoff's first law or Kirchhoff's current law, which follows the law of conservation of charge. Kirchhoff's voltage law is the sum of an EMF in a closed loop is equal to the sum of the potential drops, which follows the law of conservation of energy. Just to recap. Part B says the circuit shown in figure 5.1 contains a battery of EMF E. So this here is our battery of EMF E and negligible internal resistance connected to four resistors, R1, R2, R3, and R4. The current R3 is 0 0.3 amperes and the potential difference across R4 is 2.4 volts. Show that R is equal to four ohms. So show that R is equal to four ohms. So all of these resistors are identical, which means that this has the same resistance as this one, which has the same resistance as this one, which has the same resistance as this one. They're identical resistors. So whatever current left the battery, I know one thing for sure that because the two resistors are identical, the current would split equally. So if this here has 0 0.3 amperes, this here would also have 0 0.3 amperes. Which means the current that left the battery was 0 0.6 amperes, 0 0.6 amperes. And the current that goes to R4 is also 0 0.6 amperes. That was the first step to getting an answer. So if you figure this out, that current in R4 is equal to 0 0.6 amperes, you can use V is equal to IR. You know the potential difference across R4, which is 2.4.
you know the current in R4, which is 0 0.6 and resistance R. So R is equal to 2.4 upon 0 0.6, which is R is equal to 4 ohms. Yes, sir. That's perfect, Vishal. Determine the EMF E of the battery. The EMF E of the battery. Now you can do this directly. How do you do this directly? You can either say that this is 2.4 volts. So this should also be 2.4 volts because same resistance, same current, 2.4 volts. This here, R2 has half the current, but the same resistance. So this should be 1.2 volts or 1.2 volts. They're in parallel, they'll have the same potential difference. So in a closed loop, EMF is equal to potential drops. That is what Kirchhoff's voltage loss is. So the total EMF of the battery will be 2.4 plus 1.2 plus 2.4. You just, which closed loop are you talking about? You can take any loop that you want, Afnan. You can take this loop, 2.4 plus 1.2 plus 2.4, that should be equal to the EMF. Or you can take this loop, Two point four plus one point two plus two point four, or you don't even need to uh, consider Kirchhoff's voltage law. This is something that you've already done. We are considering that R three and R four are parallel, but we're not considering in the, it in the way that you want me to consider it. So this is what I am doing: two point four plus two point four plus one point two, which is equals to six volts. What you want me to do is. You want me to do this 2.4, ye wala 2.4 ho gaya, plus 1.2, ye upar wala 1.2 ho gaya, plus 1.2, ye niche wala 1.2 ho gaya, plus 2.4. Ibrahim, this is, is this what you want me to do? 7.2. R3 and R4 parallel hai, then ke potential same honge na? Two point four plus zero point six. No, 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 no. Not zero point six. I'm considering. Achhaji, I get it. I get what you're trying to say. But the problem here is, uh, let me redraw the circuit. Let me redraw the circuit. That would basically make everything simpler. But this time around, I'll add the values. I'll draw it like in a different way. So this is our first resistor. And this resistor has a resistance of four ohms. And this resistance, this resistor has 0 0.6 amperes. And there's a potential difference of 2.4. I've got two more resistors. I'll combine these two resistors. Parallel manner. So with with the two four ohms resistors combined, the total resistance becomes two ohms. And this also has the same current 0 0.6 because they're now combined. So the potential difference here will be 1.2. And then the third resistor of four ohms, this resistor. Once again, current of 0 0.6, 2.4 volt, you add them up. You got it. So many kya kya tha? Many resistance alag alag karne ki jaga. Many resistance in ki four or four hi rehne di thi pehle. Ibrahim is case mein, many current divide kar diya tha. Yahan pe many current same rakh ke net resistance nikal li. So I basically did the same thing. Ha current divide kar diya tha. So six volts is the answer. Parallel resistor me current divides, current divides, and the
the potential difference stays the same. 0 0.6 ampere here gets divided into 0 0.3 and 0 0.3. And the potential difference stays the same, 1.2 and 1.2. They have the same potential difference. In the same way, it is the same comparison. Voltage in dono ka current half hone ki wajah se voltage half ho gaya. Lekin half hone ke baavajood in dono ke andar voltage same hai. You don't compare it to this resistor or this resistor. Kyunki agar yahan pe teen resistors hote identical to 0 0.2, 0 0.2 or 0 0.2 ho jata. Or 0 0.2 times 4 ye 0 0.8 volts, 0 0.8 volts, and 0 0.8 volts. That would be the potential. So, in ke ek ka voltage bhi 1.2 hai, combined potential bhi 1.2 hai. That's the thing about parallel. Part C says the battery in B is replaced with another battery of the same EMF E, but with an internal resistance that is not negligible. Stated, explain the change if any in the total power produced by the battery. So this, this time around, we have an internal resistance. So when you have an internal resistance, so I've got a resistor here. Same battery, same EMF, but internal resistance this time around. When you have an internal resistance, what that does is, the total resistance of the circuit increases. The total resistance of the circuit increases. Why? Because initially our resistance was four ohms. These two combines two ohms and this here four ohms so four plus four eight plus two ten this was our initial resistance if you have a resistor let's say this is one ohm the total resistance now becomes ten plus one which is equals to eleven ohms the total resistance of the circuit if the total resistance of the circuit increases the current that leaves the battery or the current from the battery, the current from the battery decreases. And when the current from the battery decreases, that automatically means that the total power produced by the battery decreases. Because the battery load is current, it across less power, which means our battery has less power. Because battery is the power that was giving the power before, it will get all the load. Now it is giving less current, power will get load. So that's the answer to part C. Part D says the resistor and the circuit of figure 5.1 are made from nichrome wire, a wire of uniform radius 240 micrometers. The length of the wire needed to make it each resistor is 0 0.67 meters. Calculate the resistivity of nichrome. Now this is a pretty simple question. R is equal to rho L over A. They've given you the resistance, which is four ohms. They want you to calculate the resistivity. They've given you the length 0 0.67 meters. They haven't given you the area, but they've given you the cross-sectional, uh, they've given you the radius. So pi r, which is 240 micro meter squared. R is equal to rho L over A. You rearrange. Solve for rho. Rho is equals to 1.1 into 10 raised to the power minus 6 ohm meter. 
That's the answer. Any questions? So what is the power of the function? Where is Kiga in this question? So this is 10 to the power minus 6. Question number 6. Complete table 6.1 to show the masses in terms of the unified atomic mass unit U. In terms of U, unified atomic mass. And charges in terms of elementary charge, they don't want the actual mass or the actual charge. They want the mass relative to U and they want the charge in terms of E or relative to E. So for an alpha particle, an alpha particle is basically a helium nucleus. It's made up of two protons, two neutron. Each proton has a mass of one U. Each neutron has a mass of one U. So the total mass in terms of U for an alpha particle is four U. An alpha particle is helium nucleus, so the two electrons that it had are stripped off. So it has a charge of plus 2e. And because they've mentioned u over here, we won't write it here. Because they've mentioned e over here, we won't write it here. So plus 4u plus 2e beta plus particle a beta plus particle or a beta minus particle they have the same mass and that mass is 0 0.0005 u we won't write u 0 0.0005. The, the charge of a beta plus is plus one. It's a positron. The charge of a beta minus an electron is minus one. That's it. The only trouble that you may face in this question is the mass of beta plus and beta minus. Apart from that, it's pretty sim simple, straightforward. And you can calculate it out. RB says carbon 14 is radioactive and decays by the emission of beta minus particles. Nuclei do not contain beta minus particles or electrons. Explain the origin of a beta minus particle that is emitted from the nucleus during a beta minus decay. So when you have a beta minus decay, the beta minus particle that is emitted out is not from outside the nucleus. It's not one of the electrons in the outer shells of an atom. The beta minus decay happens inside the nucleus. So where does that beta minus particle come from? That beta minus comes from this. A neutron from inside the nucleus decays into a proton and an electron. A neutron decays into a proton and an electron. State the change in the quark composition of a carbon-14 nucleus when it emits a beta minus particle. So we've done this. We know that whenever you have a beta minus particle, irrespective of what element decays into what element, the a neutron will always change into a proton, irrespective of the element involved. 
and the same quark change would happen irrespective of the element involved. So what happens is, if you remember that, a down quark changes to an up quark. On the other hand, if you have a beta plus decay, an up quark changes into a down quark. Part three says, suggest why the beta minus particles are emitted with a range of different energies. Why is it, why is it that the beta minus particles that are emitted out, uh, why don't they have a constant velocity? Or why don't they have a constant energy? And the reason behind that is because beta minus particles are not the only things that are emitted out. What else is emitted out when you have a beta minus decay? When you have a beta minus decay and electron antineutrino and T, not an electron neutrino, an electron or, a neut or an anti-neutrino. So an electron anti-neutrino or an anti-neutrino is emitted out. And the energy is shared between the antineutrino and the beta particle. Or you can also mention gamma rays, but assuming there is no gamma ray, because it's not mentioned in the question. So even if there is no gamma rays, there'll always be an antineutrino emitted out when there's a beta minus particle. The combined energy may be constant, but the energy that each has would be different. That's why you get a range of energy for a beta minus particle. 